Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. The story behind the stories is what you get here, and today we talk with Jilly McMillan. Jilly was my guest last year, and she returns now to talk about her new book, The Nanny. When The Nanny opens, you quickly learn that this psychological thriller is like none you've ever read. Before we get to today's interview with Jilly, let's thank some folks that make this show possible. R.J. Panero and his brand new book, Chilling Effect, a global climate thriller. A ruthless eco-terrorist, a woman determined to stop him. Chilling Effect, R.J. Panero's newest thriller, explores a world in the not-too-distant future where terrorism is taken to a new level, one with world-ending consequences. You never know what you're capable of until the monster inside of you pushes you beyond your moral line in the sand. These are the opening thoughts of former climatologist William Christed as he prepares to attack our delicate ecosystem. He's hell-bent on avenging his father's death and will go to extremes of terrorism never before seen, all to strike a blow to those whose hubris led to his father's demise. He will take full advantage of the greed and narcissism ever present in the world as well as the fragility of our planet to ecological terrorism and use it to plot a scenario so grim yet so compellingly real it could have ripped from today's headlines. Check out the brand new thriller Chilling Effect from R.J. Panero. Michael Anderley has a brand new series that's launching. It's called Opus X, and the first book is Obsidian Detective, two rebels whose worlds collide on a planetary level. On the fringes of human space, a murder will light a fuse and send two different people colliding together. She lives on Earth, where peace among the population is a given, He is on the fringe of society where authority is how much power you wield. She's from the powerful, the elite, he's with the military. Both want the truth, but is revealing the truth good for society? Check out Obsidian Detective, the very first book that's up for pre-order now, from the new series Opus X by Michael Anderley. If you love comics the way I do, go check out Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com. Ed runs one of the best comics blogs on the internet. New episodes each Thursday come out, digging into the things that we have loved about comics and comic collecting. There's something there for everyone. Go check out cool comics in my collection at edgosney.com. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have my friend Jilly McMillan back on the show with us. Uh, She was with us just about a year ago uh, last year with her book, I Know You Know, uh, and she has a a brand new book, and today is release day for uh, Jilly. Happy release day, Jilly. And her new book, The Nanny. Let me just tell you guys, uh, if you uh, if you have a problem that you've been sleeping too much, this is the book for you, because this will cure that, I promise you. Uh, welcome back to the show, Jilly. Thank you, Hank. It's lovely to be back. Uh, I th- we had so much fun talking last time when I saw your new book was coming out. Uh, we just had to chat again. Um, you have a phenomenal ability to... Uh, to keep us turning pages and have us up worrying all night. Uh, do you remember your first experience with a book like that? One that just uh, was so engaging, but just kind of troubled you to your core. <laughs> yes, I do. And that book was a book by Linwood Barclay called no time for goodbye. I don't know if you you've read it, but it, the, the premise is that a teenage girl wakes up one morning and her whole family have disappeared. And that yeah. book, that book, I could not put down. I, I thought that was such a fantastic setup for so many yeah. reasons. It, I was gripped. Do, did you uh, uh, did you have a, a big um, were you a big fan of, of mysteries and suspense thrillers uh, as, as you were? kind of building your reading life when you were younger? Uh, I read everything. 
I, I don't think I really discriminated. I would pick up a book and if the first page sees my attention, I would stay with it. I was an obsessive reader. I still am, am, an, am an obsessive reader. Um, I absolutely loved mysteries, though. And I think one of the reasons I was drawn to them is as an adult, you have less time. And I began to read more of them on vacation and fitting them around my kids. And there's nothing like a fast paced mystery to kind of keep you going in a situation like that. Are, are you still, you, you said you're still a, a, a pretty wide reader. Do you, are, are there certain genres uh, other than mysteries like you just said for the reason you said, but are there, are there any particular genres that, that you just love to read, even if they're not in your writing wheelhouse? Probably, if you call it a genre, it, it, it would be literary fiction. Um, I don't read much romance. Um, I read a little bit of science fiction, but I'm a little bit picky about that. So it's probably literary fiction and, and the kind of literary fiction that tips over into crime and more commercial fiction and women's fiction, that kind of thing. But honestly, I'll read anything, Hank. <laughs> well, I, I definitely uh, see that, that influence and, uh, you know, I... The, those genre distinctions are so weird sometimes when you start talking about what's literary, what's not, and what's uh, genre fiction. But I, yeah, I think what, I but probably what you mean, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but literary tends to be a lot of character study. And uh, it's not so much focused on plot, but it's about a, a person's personal journey. Um, and and your, your books definitely uh, have that flavor to them. You, you really care about characters in your books, and it's not just – Tr the trouble that you find for them, but uh, allowing us to go on a journey with your characters. Is that something that that's important to you? Yeah, it appeals to me hugely when I'm when I'm reading a book. And I also obviously, yeah, um, it's something that I try and put in the books. I'm really, really interested in what happens to what we might call ordinary people, the likes of, of you and I maybe, um, although it's very hard to define ordinary, but if you're just living a regular life and then something really extraordinary happens to you, what do you do? That's the question that I'm always trying to answer, really. I'm interested in how far we push ourselves beyond what you might call acceptable limits of behavior. Sure. Um, you also... Um uh, worked in, in one of your past lives as a photographer. Uh, how do you, do you feel like your time as a photographer helps in, in your storytelling? Do you, do you feel like a photographer's eye helps you to look for details that maybe other people miss? I, I, I think it certainly helps me when I'm building a scene. I'm, I imagine a scene in a very visual way before I write it. It's almost as if I'm watching it on a screen playing out in front of me. And yes, I will, you know, to use a photographic term, I will zoom in on details, um, little things that I think will enhance the scene um, and allow the reader to build a fuller picture in their imagination. And, and you're always careful not to try to do that too much because it gets boring, but I think little things here and there, little close-ups can be quite exciting when you drop them into a scene. So, so yes, I've definitely used those skills. Julia, at what point um, when you started writing did you realize that this was, this was something that, that not only you were good at but was going to be commercially viable? That's a, uh, you know, that's a point for every writer that um, is kind of a moment of discovery uh, – but at, at at what point did you did you realize that you know I think I might be okay at this? Well, I I can remember it precisely. Um, my husband had been had gone to hospital because he had a uh, his foot had become paralyzed suddenly, and I was in London, and he was in Bristol when it happened, and I headed back on the train with my two sons, and we were all very worried, and as I was. <laughs> waiting to change trains at a station I had a call from my agent and she said your book is sold in Holland they've preempted it and that was the first sale and it was at this extraordinarily dramatic moment in my life and so I had these conflicting things happening I think I've got to get back I've got to see how my husband is doing he's fine by the way um, he had surgery it was all okay um, but also thinking my goodness you know my book's good enough to sell and it was it was a huge moment huge day how does that affect your creative process you know there's uh 
it, it it's it's a weird thing. Before you're published at all, uh, you you have what uh, I like to talk about a lot is the gift of anonymity. The um, no one knows that you're doing it, so there's there's a lot less criticism that that because you know you're just doing it for you and with the hopes that one day it will be a thing. Um, but then you know after you publish that first book, then expectations come up. But then there's a point where you know you you kind of jump that last hurdle that's keeping you from from doing this as a profession um does that affect your your creative process when you know that this this is now your livelihood uh yes very much and i think you're right to call it the gift of of anonymity um i struggle with the as many writers do with the kind of public facing aspect of writing although i love to connect with my readers it's also something i've had to learn how to do and I think that does affect how you write there's so much more to think about when I wrote my debut novel which was called what she knew I wrote it for myself I wrote a book that I would like to read and now I have to write a book for um, not just myself but my agent my editors in London and New York um, and my readers Um, and it's a matter of whether you try and write something that will please them or try and try st- stay true to what you would want to read. And I think I try and do both as far as I'm able. But if I'm ever stuck, I come back to myself as, as first reader and say, would this keep me turning pages? Because I still probably read just as much as I write. Well, you mentioned your, your agents in, in London and New York. Uh, mm-hmm. having, having books that are, are publishing in multiple countries and multiple markets – um, how does that affect the kinds of stories that you tell, or or does it? Did if you write a very uh, England centric book, uh, does does that have any any trouble carrying over to an American audience, for instance, or a, a Danish audience? Um, I can't speak so much for Europe because my European editors don't edit the books. The the people who have input into the books are my editor in New York and my editor in London, and they work together and with my agent to kind of come up with a a way forward that they agree on. Um, What's interesting, The Nanny is a really interesting example for this because it's probably my most British book with its British country setting and its upper class um, characters. And my English editor asked me to tone that down, and my U.S. editor said, don't turn it down. Don't tone it down. We love it over here. We love Downton Abbey. We love all that stuff. So that was probably one of the few times when the markets really looked as though they wanted different things. That's really funny because, uh, you know, the, the Internet uh, surely has, has broken down a lot of those barriers. Uh, television and movies, uh, for sure. You know, um, Downton Abbey, for instance, was a, a massive hit in the United States. And, right. Um, right. You know, uh, the Netflix series, The Crown, people are obsessed with that. And um, I, I, I don't know exactly what to attribute that to, but I, I feel like those culture barriers are, um, if not gone, at least a lot more accessible. I agree. And I, and I hope that means that the U.S. or the North American audience are going to are going to love the nanny. Um, I, I think they wanted it toned down here because. I suppose we're a bit closer to that class system here, and they weren't sure right. readers would enjoy those characters. But but we didn't tone it down in the end, so so we'll see. <laughs> well, tell us about the the nanny, the uh, nanny. And, and and maybe more broadly, um, when you when you start a new project, um, in, in this case the nanny. But um, when you're thinking of of a new book, what comes first to you? Is it a character? Is it a scenario? Is it some plot device that you've been wanting to play with uh how do, how does that kernel of an idea begin to to form it can form in different ways very often it's a character um that i think of sometimes it's maybe a case i've read about in the media that i can't shake from my head if i i figure if i'm still thinking about something six months after i've read about it then there's something there um the nanny came about because i was talking to my agent And we were talking about how many books um, have a missing person. Somebody goes missing. And I've done it myself. I did it in my debut. A little boy went missing. And so we thought, well, what would happen if we flipped that and somebody came back into the lives of people that they'd been close to? 
Um, and that felt quite exciting. And then we thought, well, could it be a parent? And that went that idea went out the window pretty quickly because, of course, you'd have DNA testing. Um, but then we thought, well, what if it was a nanny? What if somebody came back into your life years after they disappeared from it very dramatically and they said, I was your nanny? And you weren't exactly sure <laughs> if they were or not. And we thought that would be interesting. <laughs> well, talk about turning the genre on its head. That is, that is a fantastic way to... Uh, you- you know, readers think they're getting one story, and it and it it quickly evolves into something completely different. Um, when you when you come up with an idea like that, what if you know? What if someone comes back? What if they're the nanny? How do you start running out those themes and uh, and and how do characters come into that? I started right away to think about characters because that's that that's the next step for me. And I came up with my main character, Joe. We needed to have a little girl whose nanny had left her dramatically and without explanation um so joe was my girl so i started to develop her first um looking at her childhood and then looking at what she'd be like as an adult and in the book she has to move back to her mother's house as a sort of 30 something year old she has a daughter of her own i thought it'd be interesting to explore what she was like as a mother as well as as a child herself um and that brought me on to looking at joe's mother who is Virginia, Lady Holt, and I really wanted to explore that multi-generational thing between Joe, her mother, and her Joe's daughter. I thought that would be a fascinating little triangle to have at the heart of the book, and one that's threatened by the return of this woman who claims to be Joe's nanny. When um, uh, when the story starts to form, what what's the most fun part uh, of of writing that story and and kind of chasing down those threads what what's the most fun part for you in this book in the nanny the it was super fun because of the english country house setting um, which i had not done before and it's it's been done a lot but it was really really good to to have a go at it myself so i drove around the countryside a bit and visited big houses near me of which there are a few and just sunk myself into that little subgenre a little bit um, and that was terrific. But after that, it's really watching the characters come alive. It's letting them develop as the story goes along. I love that. When, uh, was, was there ever a character in this book that surprised you uh, in the writing? Yes. Uh, Virginia surprised me because I didn't like her much when I first began to write her. And then I liked her more because as the book developed, she got more and more intriguing for reasons that I won't go into for fear of spoilers. But she began to obsess me. I absolutely loved that character as I was writing her. It was brilliant. What year was your first book uh, published? Oh, uh, I think it was 2015. Or, yeah, I believe okay. so. Yeah. So about five years uh, in in publishing, um, yeah. you have uh, the nanny is is the nanny your sixth book, fifth book, fifth book. Okay, yeah. So about five years publishing five books. Uh, you, uh, I, I know the first book you you worked on for uh, for a while before publishing. Um, in this, you know, probably close to ten years that you've been writing and, and working this. Um, how how has your uh, your writing process and your your creative process changed over those years? I think I've become more efficient. Um, when you have all the time in the world to work on something, you, you, you don't hold yourself to account very much. And also when you are inexperienced, which I was, I was extremely inexperienced when I started. I hadn't done a creative writing course or anything like that. I just read some books and decided to have a go. So I made a ton of mistakes. And I try to avoid those now. I'm a better self-editor. I check in with myself more. I don't indulge myself. I wouldn't let myself write three pages of description of a scene just because I was enjoying it. So it's that really. It's speeding up and trying not to fall into pitfalls the way I did the first time and I did. <laughs> Some writers will um, will give advice like turn off your internal editor when you're working on your first draft because you will 
uh, begin to obsess over, you know, making this paragraph as, as perfect as it can be. And, um, I, but I know that, like you just said, you depend on that internal editor to make sure that you don't go, you know, three pages of endless description, like you just said. Mm-hmm. How do you, how do you balance those two things? How do you balance, um, making sure that the story is moving along and you're doing your job as a writer, especially a suspense writer. And, and we know that, that that book needs to move at a particular pace and we need to, to keep uh, moving forward with, um, you know, the, the self doubt that comes in and the, you know, the, the tendency to overwork something. Uh, I think I self edit in a very focused way in the first draft. So I'm not, too worried about the prose I will not rework a sentence or a paragraph even if it reads really badly and I'd be ashamed if anybody else read it I will leave it Um, I'm looking more to thrash out the plot and the pace and I still get it really really wrong in those early drafts there's often a huge amount of editing to do Um, but I do try and focus there because without that core structure you really struggle at the second draft um whereas i'm very happy to rewrite paragraphs to polish them up to improve them at that stage i'm not so happy to be reconstructing it which doesn't mean (laughs) i don't end up doing that (laughs) are you an outliner or are you discovering the story as you go I am discovering the story. I would love to be an outliner, and sometimes I try, but I just can't do it. My brain does not work that way, and um, I'm slightly envious of people who can do it. What, what are the what are the conversations like between uh, agents and editors when you're when you're uh, proposing a new project? And you, like you were just talking about earlier, you know, what if this person comes into your life, uh, but knowing that you are not an outliner, um, how does how does that conversation go with them uh, to uh, to engender that trust that uh, that you know you can get to the end of the story? You know, uh, it's it's a fantastic premise, but but can I get to the end of it? I think, well, you know, I'm not privy to those conversations, so I, I actually wouldn't like to think that I knew what was going on, maybe a bit of swearing, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I think I'm very, very fortunate to have some really good editors who do put trust in me and particularly in me and my agent because we work very closely together to to get to the end of the book. And they know that I will listen if they don't like it. I will rewrite. I will rework. And it's something I always say if debut authors ask for advice is, is you know, make sure you're open to being collaborative because often that editor input and agent input can really improve what you're doing. That's a, uh, that's a, a, a great um, thing to mention uh, because – we think of writing as a very solitary thing and, and for, for months at a time it is, it's, it's mm-hmm. you and the book and, and, and no one else. But then the editing process does become, uh, a bit of a collaboration. Um, are, are there things that, uh, that you have learned uh, along the way that help you to be more collaborative with them or, and, and is there ever a time where, um, your vision for the scene or this character um, is uh, Trump's all, you know, that, that no, you don't understand. I, I know where this is going. Trust me with this. This is the best thing for this character. I will push back, um, sometimes, but only if I'm really got a clear reasons to, I wouldn't do it from my heart. The other thing I always think is important is is just one person telling you something's wrong or all or, or, or more than one person telling you because if it's three or four or more people saying this doesn't work for me you really need to listen and you really need to change it but if you've just got one editor saying oh, I'm not sure about this and the other one says I think it's fine then you can push back with a little bit more confidence if, if you also think it's fine so as you really play it by ear I really play it by ear anyhow um, and I'm very, very careful if I fight for something because you need to pick your battles. Right. Julie, what does a writing day look like for you? Um, do you have a, a particular schedule and uh, do you hold your writing space uh, as sacred? Yeah, I do. I have to because writing a book a year, you really have to have that time. And my family are very good about it. My favorite time to write is in the morning. 
before I'm tired and before my head is full of other stuff. So an ideal day would be at my desk at 8 or 8.30, writing through to lunch, and then breaking and doing all the other sort of stuff that, that we do when, when I'm not so good at generating prose, fresh material, <laughs> which is basically after lunch. <laughs> Do you have a daily word count goal or is it just be in the chair you know, until lunch and, and this is the time for prose writing? Uh, I try uh, when I'm when I'm not running up to a deadline, I try for a thousand words a day, but I won't beat myself up because some days you just can't. And that means you need to go and think about it and do something else. And it might be better to go and do the grocery shopping. Um, right. your brain refreshes so but but right now um for example i'm rushing up to a deadline so it's two thousand words a day and that's the rule through your writing career have you discovered uh any things that that make your life easier that and that make book writing easier are there any uh computer apps uh maybe a, a note-taking um device that you've come up with ha have you discovered things that make it easier for you um, the only thing that really makes it easier is having a space where I can just leave all my stuff and have it untouched. So I now have a little office, which I didn't used to have, um, and nobody moves my stuff, and that makes me happy. Um, but I am very, very simple in terms of my requirements. I just need a Word document, a laptop. It's nice to have a desktop too, so you can move between them if your shoulders get tired. Um, otherwise, I write all my notes in the back of envelopes and things. It drives my husband crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the the uh, the book is just a, a living uh, word document from beginning to end. Yep, that's how it goes. Yeah, I, I again, I aspire to be to use Scrivener and things like that, but I just it just doesn't really work for me. Uh, you know, I I have lots of friends who are diehard Scrivener users, okay. and and I've written. Uh, a few projects in Scrivener and it, it can be fantastic, but uh, there's just something about just popping open a word document, having a blank slate and just putting words down. Um, I, I guess it all comes down to what you're comfortable with and, and how easily distracted you are by all the buttons yeah. and bells and whistles. I think, I think it's also to do with how your mind works and we all work in different ways, don't we? And I think that structured thing that Scrivener offers can be really super helpful for some people. Right. Do you uh, do you write in silence or do you have uh, music that you listen to? I write um, a mixture. Sometimes I love to play music to try and create a mood, a vibe for a certain um, scene. I did a lot of playing um, the soundtrack of True Detective when I was writing I Know You Know because I loved that vibe. Oh, um, yeah. but sometimes I'll be in silence. Yeah, I kind of mix it up a bit. I like that. Um, when you... Um... When you're writing and when you're when you're deep into a project, um, can you read other authors in your genre, or do you uh, kind of turn turn that off so that you are kind of getting your pure thoughts? Uh, what, what is your reading life like when you're in the midst of a project? It's not that different from usual, but it's because I suppose because my projects are so continual. Um, but there are moments where I have to put away crime thrillers because it's too much. It's too much to write them all day and then read them back to back. So I will read them, but I'll ration them. The, the new book uh, is out everywhere now. The Nanny. Um, Jilly, when, when people are reading this, what do you hope uh, that they get from this book? Is uh, Other than just pure entertainment, are, are you hoping that people get a certain feeling, a, a certain – uh, memory comes to them. What, what do what do you hope their connection to this book is? Uh, I hope they'll connect with the relationships between the grandmother, her daughter, and her granddaughter. That's that's a, a, a big it was a big deal for me when I was writing it, and I hope that people can connect to that. Otherwise, I think I really hope they just enjoy the ride. Um, I had a Tess Gerritsen gave me a quote for it, which just said. This book is like Downton Abbey gone very, very wrong. I hope people really enjoy that vibe as well. <laughs> that, that was that's the perfect quote. That is exactly what this book is. It's so amazing. Uh, so, Jilly, I know that you're in the midst of another project. Uh, what what are you working on now? Can you give us any hints of to what's coming up next year? 
can't say too much. Um, I'm working on a book that's actually about a crime writer, so that's been interesting. Um, and it's really a little bit of a journey into psychological horror. It's a little bit more focused and fast-paced and scary. Oh, I love it. I love it. The <laughs> writing about writers is is kind of one of the best guilty pleasures ever. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. Well, Jilly, uh, it's been fun catching up. Uh, we're going to send everyone to pick up their copy of The Nanny. Uh, there's a link to it in the show notes. Um, this is out in, in hardback in the States. And uh, also Kindle Edition and audiobook. If you've not listened to one of Jilly's audiobooks, uh, make that a priority. You will absolutely love it. Um, Jilly, thank you so much for coming back on the show. We're going to send everyone to see you. Uh, tell, tell people your website where they can find you, please. It, my website is www.jillymacmillan.com. Perfect, perfect. We're going to send everyone to see you. Uh, thanks for coming back on the show, Jilly. Thanks so much, Hank. It's been a pleasure. Thanks to Jilly McMillan for joining me today. You can find all of the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. Leave us a comment to show some love for the show and for our guests. Stay tuned now for an audiobook clip from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. I was walking through the woods between Wolfert's Roost and the future site of my father's stone manor house. The house would eventually stand on what had been old Baltus's pumpkin field, the land where I had found my grandfather's head. Father had chosen the spot for its view of the Hudson River. Knoll was to be a grand mansion in the Gothic Revival style, but at the time the mansion was but a few foundations of Van Brunt stone. I had become fond of the place already, the idea of it, and I spent many a night alone in a shack on the property. My mother disapproved. She would have me sleep in the room across from hers in our townhouse. But I was fifteen and did not answer to her. I kept a bottle of spirits hidden in the crook of two walnut trees near old Baltus's grave. I thought he would approve of the gesture. I had stopped along my way to fetch it out. At the moment the first pull of liquor touched my throat, I heard a ghastly, inhuman laugh. I was not alone in the woods. Had God sent the horseman after me? Had I sinned that terribly? I ran through the wood and found the field where Knoll was to be built. The outline of the foundations was barely discernible beneath the snow. An apparition stood there. Though I have seen him many times since, I shall never forget my first glimpse. Gaunt in moonlight, headless, exuding power and malice. A magic thing in the land of the ordinary. The headless horseman of Sleepy Hollow. What chills those words evoke. It charged at me, hatchet raised. I stood transfixed, unable to move, unable to even imagine escape. This was the servant of God, after all, sent to strike down sinners. I hurled the bottle from my hand, ashamed that I had become a drunkard as Baltus had been. It shattered against the foundations of Knoll. I stretched out my arms and awaited judgment. A piercing white light broke the darkness. The horse reared. Not my Dylan, cried Agatha, appearing from the wood. She held a skull in her hand. It shone brightly as a diamond. And in that moment I understood. The horseman did not serve God. He served my grandmother. Perhaps in that moment I came to see Agatha and God as one and the same. The unholy spirit fought her command. A foreleg of the demon horse struck my head with such power that I fell backwards with a cry and knew no more. I carry the scar to this day. A slight indentation in my temple, barely noticeable. In my days of courting I was told that when I am angry the patch of insulted skull bone will stand out in a disturbing manner. I have never had occasion to see this phenomenon, however, as I am generally well pleased whenever I pass a mirror. <laughs> 